This is a picture test in practical anatomy of the upper limb. You may use the video as a revision for the topic or as a self-assessment tool. For the purpose of self-assessment, you may pause the video and spend your own time to read the question and come up with the answer. Then replay the video to confirm your answer by listening to the comments and explanations. Now I will deal with the shoulder region and axilla. Which nerves A to E is most likely injured in this type of fracture? It is clear from the radiograph that there is a fracture at the surgical neck of the humerus. The surgical neck is the neck that connects the proximal end of the humerus with the shaft, and the axillary nerve lies in close proximity to the surgical neck and might be injured in such a fracture. Now let's look at the dissection. The axillary nerve and the radial nerve are the two terminal branches of the posterior cord of the brachial plexus. This is the posterior cord of the brachial plexus and we can see all of its branches, the five branches. Now to identify the axillary nerve, it's a large nerve that the first thing that it does is that it leaves the axilla by passing through the quadriangular space here in the posterior wall, very close to the lower part of the shoulder joint. The other terminal branch, the radial nerve, the larger branch passes straight down to the arm. The other three branches are small branches. Here you can see the upper subscapular, lower subscapular, which supplies subscapularis, and a medium-sized branch in between upper and lower subscapular nerves that we can follow it to supply latissimus dorsi. So the answer here is C, the axillary nerve. Identify the fossa A which muscle is attached to it, and what is the distal attachment of this muscle. So this is the subscapular fossa that is uh, occupied by subscapularis muscle. It's a big muscle here, and then the muscle uh, tapers to form a tendon that passes in front of the capsule of the shoulder joint to be attached to the front of the proximal end of the humerus. Specifically, it is attached to the lesser tubercle of the humerus. Fibers A and B are parts of a single muscle. Identify the muscle. What is the action of each part on the shoulder joint and what is the origin of the third part of the muscle not shown in the picture? The deltoid muscle arises from the clavicle and scapula, from the acromion and the spine of the scapula. And as you can see here, that the attachment of deltoid is immediately below the attachment of trapezius muscle. The central fibers A, which arise mainly from the acromion process, are very strong multipinnate fibers consisting of groups of bipinnate fibers, so that's why it's called multipinnate. This is the shape of the muscle, and a muscle that is multipinnate is usually strong muscle. Now the main action of deltoid muscle is abduction of the shoulder joint, but acting in part, the anterior fibers, which you can see here, rising from the clavicle, they are parallel fibers, so they flex and medially rotate the humerus. The middle fibers, the strong fibers, are the main abductors, and the posterior fibers, they arise from the spine of the scapula posteriorly. They are also parallel fibers, and they can extend and laterally rotate the humerus at the shoulder joint. So the anterior and posterior fibers are alternating in action when swinging the arm during walking, flexing and extending the shoulder joint. Identify the vessel A in which groove it lies at this position. Now here the deltoid muscle is pushed away a little bit, dissected and pushed away laterally. And that's why the space between the deltoid and pectoralis major muscle appears to be wide. This space is called the deltopectoral triangle. You can see it here, the deltopectoral triangle between deltoid and 
pectoralis major muscle. Since deltoid is attached to the lateral third of the clavicle and pectoralis major to the medial half of the clavicle, there is a small part of the clavicle to which neither muscle is attached, and this forms the base of the triangle, the deltopectoral triangle. This triangle might be visible in thin people. The deltopectoral triangle contains some lymph nodes, infraclavicular lymph nodes, and it also contains, as we can see here, the termination of the cephalic vein, A. The floor of the triangle is formed by deep fascia called the clavipectoral fascia, and it is pierced by the cephalic vein in order to drain into the deep vein in the region, the axillary vein. Identify the muscle B, list two of its actions on the shoulder joint. The muscle B is pectoralis major muscle. It is located in front of the chest. And as you can see here, that it has a clavicular head arising from the clavicle, as we have just mentioned. And the other head here is called the sternocostal head. Not the entire extent of it is shown here, but it's a big head that tapers into the tendon. And the tendon of the muscle is attached to the lateral lip of the intertubercular groove of the humerus. You can see here, this is the region of the lateral lip of the intertubercular groove. The groove is located here, and you can see that it lodges the tendon of the long head of biceps muscle, and the tendon is crossing in the front of the long head of biceps and attached to the lateral lip of the intertubercular groove. Having such an attachment, the muscle is therefore an adductor and medial rotator of the arm at the shoulder joint, and the clavicular head, if it acts alone, it will flex the humerus as well. Name the nerve and vessels located at position A. The neurovascular bundle A represents the axillary nerve winding around the surgical neck of the humerus, deep to deltoid muscle, which has been dissected here and reflected. The axillary nerve leaves the axilla by passing through the posterior wall, quadrangular space, and it is accompanied by posterior circumflex humeral vessels, which are shown here to accompany the axillary nerve around the surgical neck of the humerus. This posterior circumflex humeral artery is a branch of the third part of the axillary artery. Identify the muscle B. What is the nerve supply? What is the action on the scapula? B is levator scapulae muscle, and this muscle together with rhomboid minor, which is shown here, and rhomboid major, not shown, they connect the scapula to the spine. Levator scapulae connects the medial border of the scapula with the transverse processes of some cervical vertebrae. Levator scapulae, as shown here, is attached to the superior part of the medial border, while rhomboid minor is attached at the root of the scapular spine. The rhomboid major, which is not shown here, is attached to the medial border inferior to the scapular spine. All the three muscles are supplied by the dorsal scapular nerve from the brachial plexus, and all the three muscles they act to elevate and retract the scapula. They also medially rotate the scapula so that the glenoid cavity faces downwards. Identify the muscle A. What is its action on the scapula? The muscle is rhomboid major muscle. It's attached to the lower part of the medial border of the scapula, connects the medial border of the scapula with the spines of thoracic vertebrae, Thus, this muscle elevates, retracts, and medially rotates the scapula, an action which is very similar to the rhomboid minor and levator scapulae located above it. Identify the shaded triangle, which intercostal space it overlies. The triangle is called the triangle of auscultation, and the boundaries of this triangle are trapezius, latissimus dorsi, and rhomboid major muscle. The triangle enlarges when the scapula is protracted, such as by folding the arms across the chest and the trunk is flexed in that position. The floor is formed by ribs six and seven, and in between them is the sixth intercostal space. Thus, 
the six intercostal space becomes subcutaneous, therefore respiratory sounds may be heard better with a stethoscope in this triangle of auscultation. What is the action of muscle B? Muscle B is the latissimus dorsi muscle, the wide muscle of the back. The muscle, as you can see, has a very wide origin from lower thoracic, lumbar vertebrae, the iliac crest in here. But then the muscle fibers will taper and form a tendon that wraps around teres major muscle to be attached to the front of the proximal part of the humerus, to the floor of the intertubercular groove of the humerus. Having such an attachment, the muscle is therefore an adductor, medial rotator, and extensor of the humerus. To remember the action of this muscle, remember the position of the arm attained when scratching the opposite scapula. The muscle might act from the opposite direction, that's to say when the arm is fixed, the muscle will pull the trunk and is thus important for climbers. It is similar in this case to pectoralis major when acting from an opposite direction. Both latissimus dorsi and pectoralis major act as a sling from the trunk to the arm, but latissimus dorsi is more powerful than pectoralis major when pulling the trunk up on a monkey bar. Which muscle is missing here? This is an axial CT of the chest showing a vertebra posteriorly as well as the scapula. Anteriorly, this is the sternum and sections of ribs. The ribs are located obliquely, so in a horizontal section, multiple sections of ribs are shown. The missing muscle is the big muscle that covers the pectoral region, that is the pectoralis major muscle. You can compare to the other side where the muscle is intact. This is a congenital absence of pectoralis major muscle. Identify the structures one to five. This is an horizontal section of a cadaver at the level of the shoulder joint. You can see here the humeral head articulating with the glenoid fossa of the scapula here. Look at the articular surfaces covered by hyaline cartilage, whitish cartilage here. And look at the disproportion between the area of the head of the humerus and the area of the glenoid fossa. The glenoid fossa is shallow. It is small as compared with the wider area of articulation on the head of the humerus and this is the reason why this joint is uh, the shoulder joint is mobile but is less stable covering the shoulder joint from anterior lateral and posterior is this very big muscle here number one and this is the deltoid muscle and three is another muscle that arises from the front of the chest as you can see here it is arising from the clavicle four this is the clavicle, the bone, and the muscle is pectoralis major muscle. Between the deltoid and pectoralis major is the deltopectoral groove that allows the passage of a vein here. This is the cephalic vein, the superficial vein, that passes through the deltopectoral groove, passes through the clavipectoral fascia to end in the axillary vein, the deep vein. Five is a bony process that extends forwards from the scapula and this is the coracoid process of the scapula. Note the proximity of the coracoid process of the scapula to the deltopectoral triangle where the, in the depth of the triangle and in thin people the coracoid process can be felt. Identify the bony process A. This is the spine of the scapula on its posterior aspect. Name the fossa B and which muscle is attached to the fossa. The spine of the scapula divides the posterior aspect of the scapula into a, a supraspinous and infraspinous fossa. Attached to the infraspinous fossa is a big muscle which is called the infraspinatus muscle here. This is a member of the rotator cuff group of muscles.